The islands have been described as a cinder pile 600 miles out in the Pacific Ocean. The Galapagos consist entirely of volcanic lava spewed out from the ocean bed. In two million years, some of the lava has broken down into soil, but in places, it looks as though it flowed only yesterday. Much of the vegetation that has colonized the islands is as weird as the landscape. This Brachycereus cactus is the first plant to grow in a recently formed lava flow. The lowland areas are completely arid. This is where the Opuntia grows freely, a prickly pear species which, like so many of the other plants, only grows in the Galapagos. Then there's the candelabra-like Jasminocereus cactus. There are greener areas, but you must climb to reach them. Volcanoes rise on some of the largest islands to heights of between three and 6,000 feet. This is Alcedo Crater on the island of Isabella. Around the crater, condensing steam from fumaroles and the moisture from low clouds produce mosses, ferns, and vegetation of tropical lushness. Much of the shoreline is uncompromisingly harsh. The lava constantly pounded by the Pacific swell. The unique quality of the landscape, the flora and the fauna, raises many fascinating questions. How did the ancestors of the present Galapagos creatures get to these remote islands in the first place? When did they arrive? How did the islands themselves appear, quite recently in geological time, on the face of the Pacific Ocean? Fortunately, that part of the puzzle is the easiest to solve. The Galapagos belong to Ecuador. They're situated on the equator, about 600 miles out in the Pacific Ocean. Two geological features have produced the Galapagos. First, they are close to the junction of three of the Earth's moving plates, the Cocos, Pacific, and Nazca plates. Secondly, they lie over one of the Earth's volcanic hotspots, where the molten rock pierces the plates. The Nazca plate, on which the islands sit, is moving eastward at about three inches a year. The active volcanic islands, such as Isabella and Fernandina, are still over the hotspot. Those to the east have already moved away. They are therefore old and cold. In about 20 million years, the present islands will have moved with the Nazca plate until they finally disappear beneath the waves. But by then, it's possible that the hotspot will have produced other islands to replace them. This is what the volcanic process looks like when it happens on the seabed. The emission of lava has been going on for more than 10 million years. Gradually, the underwater lava built up a vast platform with large fissures through which the lava flowed. The weird pillar formations are typical of floods of lava on the ocean floor. They are caused by columns of rapidly cooling molten rock. Eventually, the plateau increased in extent and height until, about five million years ago, some volcanoes broke through the surface.
times, as in the case of the largest island, Isabella, several volcanoes emerged and eventually joined up to form one big island. The process is continuing at this moment. The Galapagos are one of the most active volcanic ocean areas on Earth. There are some 13 main islands, four of them sparsely inhabited, and over 40 rocks and islets in the archipelago. Isabella, the largest island, is some 75 kilometers long and in parts 40 kilometers wide. It has five large, still active volcanoes, the largest rising to nearly 6,000 feet. Isabella, one of the most westerly islands, is still over the volcanic hotspot. Most of the islands are less than two million years old, some less than one million. Isabella is one of the younger ones. To the west of it, separated by a narrow strait called the Bolivar Channel, lies Fernandina with one highly active volcano. Near the shore are some brackish lagoons and mangrove thickets. Inland, much of Fernandina is composed of brittle lava, practically impossible to walk on. Santa Cruz is an older island. Its volcanic days are over. The highlands in the background are a reminder of that past. Santa Cruz is the second largest island. It has one small town and harbour. It's also the headquarters of the Galapagos National Park and the Darwin Research Station. Española, the most southerly island, is of different origin. It's a flat lump of lava about four miles long up thrust from the seabed. This is where 20,000 pairs of waved albatrosses nest in two colonies. It's one of the earliest islands, probably about four million years old. Floriana is an old island also. It was the scene of much volcanic activity in the past. It has more than 50 small cones, the largest of which rises to over 2,000 feet. Islets and rocks are a common feature of the Galapagos. This is Daphne Minor, an extinct crater. In the distance is Daphne Major, whose crater is a great attraction to nesting seabirds, especially blue-footed boobies. Different as they are in shape and size, all the islands are volcanic, all between four and one million years old, and all, one way or another, rose from the seabed. The islands, great and small, are home to possibly the strangest and certainly most fascinating animal population on Earth. Heading the cast, if only by virtue of sheer weight and size, come the giant tortoises, Galapagos in Spanish, after which the islands take their name. The males can weigh up to 600 pounds. It's thought that they can live for up to 200 years, though no one has yet been able to confirm this in the wild. Though they have few natural predators, these harmless vegetarians have suffered heavily at the hands of man and have been completely wiped out on some of the islands. The surviving tortoises live mainly in the moist volcanic uplands because of the plentiful vegetation there. Next, the two great lizards of the Galapagos. The land iguanas are usually found in the dry areas, but once a year during the breeding season, the largest concentration of all occurs on the crater rim of the great active volcano on the island of Fernandina. Fernandina's land iguanas come here to nest each year.
There's never been a land bridge connecting the islands to South or Central America, so only a few mammals, two bats and some rat species, have ever made the journey. Reptiles are more adapted to ocean travel. To look at the marine iguana, you'd hardly imagine that it had evolved from the same ancestor as the land iguana. This one is in breeding colours. It's the only marine lizard in the world feeding on algae both on the lava rocks and below the surface. Of the seabirds, half are endemic species or subspecies. One of those unique to the islands is the Galapagos flightless cormorant. The swallowtail gull, another unique species, is the only nocturnal gull in the world. It's likely that it has adapted to feeding at night in order to escape the food-stealing attentions of the frigate birds. The large eye is typical of a nocturnal creature. The swallowtail gull is so unlike all other gulls that it is placed in a genus on its own. The other gull species found only in the Galapagos is the lava gull, though it does have a close relative on the mainland, the laughing gull. The grey lava colouring from which it takes its name is all its own. Possibly it's an adaptation that helps it escape the frigate bird's attention by enabling it to merge more successfully with its background. The Galapagos hawk has obvious buzzard ancestors on the mainland, but it too is a separate Galapagos species. Like so much else in the archipelago, it's quite unafraid of man. It's a fierce and successful predator, preying on small birds, larva lizards and young iguanas. Along with the tortoises, iguanas and finches, the Galapagos mockingbirds gave Charles Darwin pointers towards his theories on evolution. Quite different from mainland mockingbirds, they've evolved into four separate species. They're opportunist feeders and scavengers and can be quite fiercely predatory. The victims here are newly hatched turtles. Of the seabirds that choose the islands as their only breeding ground, the waved albatross is the most impressive. 20,000 pairs nest on the island of Española. As if the Galapagos bird list isn't strange enough, it includes a penguin. The Galapagos penguin is the most northerly of all penguin species. Like the penguin, fur seals belong in cold, even sub-Antarctic seas. Like the penguin too, the Galapagos fur seal differs sufficiently from its nearest relatives to be given the status of a separate species. The sea lions differ from their ancestors in California, mainly in size. They're slightly smaller and are a Galapagos subspecies. The 13 species of finches, often called Darwin's finches, are the evolutionary showpiece of the archipelago. Small, rather uninteresting looking birds, they have descended from one common mainland ancestor. The most amazing of all is the woodpecker finch, which uses a stick or cactus spine to winkle insects out of dead trees, and thus becomes one of nature's few tool-using animals.
Once the islands had appeared, how did the ancestors of the present unique Galapagos species reach them? There's no doubt that the sea lions came south from California. The fur seals and penguins came from the opposite direction, led by the cold Peru current. The route taken by tortoises, iguanas and finches is less certain. Some experts name South America as their starting point. But today, many scientists think that Central America, in the region of Panama, is more likely. The finches were probably blown by unfavorable winds. Tortoises and iguanas may either have floated or rafted. The riverside forests of the Isthmus of Panama were probably the original home of the ancestors of the reptiles who now inhabit the Galapagos. No one can be quite certain, but this is now thought to be the creature from which evolved the two very different species of Galapagos iguana. It's a green iguana, common in much of Central and South America. The green iguana is very much at home in water. It has to be, living in riverine forests often inundated by floodwaters. It's no rare event for these big lizards to fall accidentally into water. But the fact is that they are excellent swimmers and sometimes choose this method of locomotion. When you watch the big lizard swimming, the resemblance to the marine iguana is striking. Hind legs are held close to the side and propulsion comes from sinuous movements of tail and body. Head and crest are quite similar to the profile of the Galapagos land iguana. No one seriously suggests that the green iguana swam a thousand ocean miles to make a landfall on the Galapagos, but there was a possible form of transport available to it. The iguana often climbs on rafts of floating vegetation. In flood seasons, very large rafts are a common sight on the big rivers of Central and South America. These rafts eventually make their way out to sea, so it's possible that the iguanas and other reptiles like lizards and snakes hitched a lift to the Galapagos in this way. The rafting theory also holds good for the probable mainland ancestor of the giant Galapagos tortoises, Obviously, this tortoise wouldn't have made it all the way to the islands, but no doubt logs carried some smaller reptiles there. The ancestral tortoise, Geocelloni, is widely distributed on the mainland. It's a small animal by comparison with the Galapagos giants. But tortoises, lacking competition on isolated oceanic islands, are known to evolve into giant forms. The same thing has happened to the tortoises on the island of Aldabra, far out in the Indian Ocean. The ancestor of the Galapagos finches probably looked like this dull-looking little bird, the blue-black grass quit. Ancestral grass quits presumably got blown to the islands accidentally. They may even have staged via the Cocos Islands, 600 miles to the northeast. There's a related species of finch found there today. It's been estimated that no matter how many rafts of vegetation sank, and most undoubtedly did, one successful crossing by a pregnant female iguana or tortoise every 100,000 years would have been sufficient to give the islands their present populations. But the odds stacked against the immigrants were longer than that. For many thousands of years after the islands emerged from the sea, there would have been very little vegetation and therefore no food for new arrivals. Many seeds can survive long immersion in salt water. Some plant colonists arrived by sea. A bursara seed has taken root amongst the lava. Lichens were almost certainly the first plants to establish themselves. But lichens wouldn't have provided any food nor would Brachycereus cactus, a fairly recent arrival itself. Some seeds and spores were windborne. Grass seeds are often spread by birds. Gradually the vegetation built up 
in this inhospitable landscape. This dark rumped petrel gives a vivid demonstration of how some seeds certainly made the journey to the islands. At first sight, its plumage appears to be oiled. In fact, its feathers are weighed down with sticky seeds. They happen to be the seeds of a tree already present in the islands, but they could just as easily have been carried from anywhere within such a seabird's wide range. Even today, the flora of the islands is a very limited one. Most of the plants possess small and inconspicuous flowers. This is probably because there are very few insects and therefore little need to evolve showy blossoms to attract pollinators. There is only one species of solitary bee, the Galapagos carpenter bee. It's thought to be a fairly recent immigrant. Since carpenters nest in wood, it's likely to have drifted here inside a log. Nevertheless, it's been in the Galapagos long enough to have evolved into an endemic species. That's the male. He's a bright yellow. The female carpenter bee is black. Yellow flowers seem to attract the bees most. Among the other pollinating insects are eight species of butterflies, one endemic, and many species of moths. The difficulties facing those first animal colonists can hardly be exaggerated. First, a sea crossing of up to 1,000 miles. Second, a landfall on a coast that is for the most part totally hostile to seaborne invasion. Third, the likelihood that if you do get ashore, there is no food waiting for you. Lastly, the distinct possibility that you will never find a mate. Imagine that you are a mainland tortoise or a green iguana that has survived a month at sea. You've been washed ashore in the surf and now have to scale an obstacle like this. Yet against all these odds, enough made it to become the unique Galapagos species we know today. We'll never know how many rafts of vegetation carrying reptiles from the mainland sank, crossing a thousand miles of sea to the Galapagos. Several times in the last million years, one must have made it, carrying a female green iguana with fertile eggs inside her. The descendants of those first lizard settlers followed two divergent paths. One led to the sea, and eventually to a new species, the marine iguana. It's probable that in their search for a vacant food niche, some of the new arrivals exploited the green iguana's already considerable aquatic talents. On the rocks and in the tidal pools was a plentiful supply of food in the form of marine algae. Over many thousands of years, by the process of natural selection which Darwin described, some of the green iguana colonists adapted to a marine environment. The snout became blunt, so that the iguana could crop seaweed close to the rocks. It learned to stay submerged for longer and longer periods in order to feed. It did so by slowing down its metabolism to conserve oxygen. Adult marine iguanas have been known to stay submerged for 30 minutes and can feed at depths of 15 meters. To cope with the surf, claws and forelegs became exceptionally strong. Marine iguanas seem to prefer shorelines with powerful wave action. 
This is where the seeds on which they feed grow best. Another adaptation to marine life is the flattened tail to give propulsion when swimming. The normally dark skin helps to absorb heat after feeding in the sea. The male iguana, with its pronounced crest, is quite an intimidating creature. The bony plates on top of the head play their part in mating fights. The scientific name for the species is Amblyrhynchus, blunt nose. The marine iguana allows the finches, this is a small ground finch, to clean parasites from its skin. A larva lizard pulls dead skin from an iguana's tail. It's another Galapagos species that must have rafted here in the remote past. In the breeding season, both sexes become coloured, though the degree to which they do so varies between islands. There are seven subspecies of marine iguanas. The most highly coloured of all, this is one of them, come from the island of Española. The establishment of a breeding territory is very important. It's won by an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation between rival males and sometimes lasts four or five hours. These less colourful males come from the island of Fernandina. The importance of a territory, which can be anything from one to ten square metres, but maybe just a single block of lava, is that a good site attracts more females. The poorer sites are lower down near the water. In winning and holding his territory, a male may lose a quarter of his body weight over a six-week period. Actual mating with various females occurs over about three weeks. The females, they have less pronounced crests and are usually smaller, excavate the nest and lay from one to three eggs, five weeks after mating. They both excavate and fill in the nest hole by shoveling earth with their hind feet. Then they stay on guard at the nest site for up to ten days. The nest hole was probably a trial excavation, or one in which she wasn't yet ready to lay her eggs. That doesn't stop the mockingbirds from seeing if there are any eggs for them to steal. Failing that, they search for insects, disturbed by the iguana's digging. Young iguanas have several enemies. One of the most effective is the Galapagos hawk, a powerful raptor, well suited to seizing ground prey. The non-poisonous Galapagos snake, Dromicus, one more reptile that voyaged from the mainland to become a Galapagos species, is partial to lava lizards and very small iguanas. It's only the size of a grass snake itself. There are today between two and three hundred thousand marine iguanas in the archipelago. Natural predation doesn't affect their numbers. What does drastically reduce them from time to time is a failure of ocean currents affecting the growth of the seaweeds on which they feed. These corpses were to be seen on every shore after a drastic upset of ocean temperatures by the warm water mass called El Nino in 1982. But such disasters must have happened many times since the first ancestral iguana landed there. No doubt they will happen many times again. Two years after the 1982 disaster, the marine iguana population was fast recovering.
The same green iguana from the mainland is thought to be the ancestor of the Galapagos land iguana. Evolutionary speaking, the land iguana didn't have so far to go as its marine cousin. But it did have to make a number of adaptations to Galapagos living. There is practically no fresh water in the islands, so its jaws had to become powerful enough to break off and crush moisture-containing vegetation like cactus pads and fruit. It lacks the long claws of the marine iguana. It doesn't have to cling on in surf, but they have to be powerful and blunt for digging. The larva lizard catching flies is in no danger. Land iguanas are vegetarians, and the lizard is doing it a favor. The iguana's yellow color is in complete contrast to its marine cousin. But then the land iguana's problem is to lose heat, not gain it. The blotchy pattern also helps to camouflage it. In some ways, the adaptations which the ancestor of the land iguana had to make were as foreign to it as those of the marine species. The green iguana of the mainland had lived largely in lush, wet forests. In the Galapagos, it was faced with an almost completely dry landscape, abundant with cactus. Many lizard species are at home in semi-desert conditions, and the land iguana is no exception. On the six islands where it is still found, it prefers the dry zones with low, sparse scrub. Because of the moisture stored in its fleshy pads, opuntia is a favorite food. The big lizards will even wait under the trees for ripe fruits to drop. Very few animals will eat a puntia. It's too well armed with spines. The land iguana has developed techniques for dealing with the situation, either by biting between the main groups of spines or by rolling the fallen fruits on the ground to flatten or knock the spines off. They must still get plenty of spines stuck in the mouth and jaws, but these don't appear to cause any permanent harm crater-like hole in this iguana's head is probably the result of an accident early in its life. Finches play quite an important part in the land iguana's life. The marine iguana is quite happy to let finches clean the parasites off its skin and it doesn't go out of its way to solicit their aid. The land iguana lets the birds know when it is inviting them by raising itself on all four legs so that the finch can do a thorough job. So the land iguanas are mainly to be found in the dry lowlands. But there is one notable exception, and that occurs on the island of Fernandina. The rising sun unveils the unearthly landscape on the crater rim of Fernandina's great active volcano. The volcanic highlands are the one place where moisture can be found all year round. 
but it is a difficult and arduous journey to reach those craters. At first over crumbly lava, then up through arid scrub, until the lush green fed by cloud moisture is reached. Many of the land iguanas of Fernandina make this journey every nesting season. There's little doubt what draws them, the soft, warm layers of volcanic dust around and inside the crater. The crater rim provides some strange contrasts. Close to the ash fields grows rich green vegetation, watered by condensation from the clouds that often envelop the top of the volcano. Some of the shrubs bear fruit and flowers on which the iguanas feed during the nesting period. The females return to the same breeding areas each year. They inspect the territories on arrival and it's they rather than the males who choose the mate. A large percentage of the females on Fernandina make the climb to the crater rim. At peak nesting time in July, the volcanic dust is crisscrossed with their trails. The female excavates the nest hole in which she lays between 7 and 23 eggs. Then, like her relative the marine iguana, she mounts guard for several days. Giocelloni, the probable mainland ancestor of the giant Galapagos tortoises, could easily have crossed a thousand miles of Pacific Ocean on a raft of vegetation. It's a lightweight weighing only about 10 pounds. Even without the aid of a raft, it can survive floating in salt water for up to a month. There are 14 subspecies of Galapagos giant tortoises. On the largest island, Isabella, the tortoises even differ slightly from region to region. The tortoises on each of the five volcanoes there are separate subspecies. The five races, separated by hostile terrain, don't interbreed. These are Santa Cruz tortoises, enjoying a mud wallow in the humid uplands of the center of the island. It was pointed out to Darwin by the governor of the Galapagos that tortoises on different islands had different shaped carapaces, or shells. Those on Santa Cruz are smooth, dome-shaped, and low at the front, adaptations that enable them to move more easily through dense vegetation. The carapace of an Espanola tortoise is high in front. It has evolved this way for its owner to be able to reach up for the sparse, scrubby vegetation that Espanola offers. It is a low, dry island with no volcanic uplands. The giant tortoises like a regular wallow in a swamp. You might think that a tortoise wouldn't be worried by mosquitoes, but the soft underparts are vulnerable to their bites. A good coating of mud offers protection. There were once hundreds of thousands of tortoises in the Galapagos. Buccaneers, sealers and whalers decimated them for food. In 1831 alone, 68 ships took 13,000 tortoises aboard. Sadly, it was often the smaller and easier to load females the sailors caught and ate. The estimated total population today is between 12 and 15,000 animals, split between six islands. On Santa Fe and Floriana, they've been extinct for over a century. As recently as 1980, the remains of 27 tortoises were found on Wolf Volcano on the island of Isabella, slaughtered, it is thought, by fishermen. Their main enemies, however, are pigs, dogs, cats and rats, all introduced animals that man has allowed to escape. 
The story of the tortoises on Pinta Island is a particularly sad one. There is only one survivor, a male called Lonesome George. He's safe at the Darwin Station on Santa Cruz, but he has no female of his own subspecies with whom to mate. From January to April, the tortoises gather in the moist uplands to breed. At these times, the highlands resound to the hoarse roars of mating males and the clash of giant carapaces, inseparable from tortoise courtship. Giant tortoises take a long time to mature. It's probable that they're 30 or 40 years old before they reach breeding age. After mating, most of the females make the long, slow journey down to the lowlands to dig their nests and lay an average of 10 eggs each. Scientists still argue about the ancestor of the 13 species of Galapagos finches. But this bird, Volatinia jacarina, the blue-black grass quit, is a firm favourite. This is one of its descendants, the cactus finch. The Galapagos finches are one of nature's most striking examples of adaptive radiation. This is where one original species adapts to local feeding and living conditions by altering its behavior and even physical shape. Over many years, it may evolve into several different species. With the Galapagos finches, the differences can mainly be seen in the bill shapes. It was this that Darwin noted and which became a key part in his subsequent theories on evolution. Compare the heavy probing and seed cracking bill of the medium ground finch with the delicate bill of the tree finch. The bill in each case has adapted to the bird's style of feeding. The bill of the smallest finch of all is an even more striking contrast. The warbler finch has the typical bill of a bird that lives by catching insects. The success of the finches is largely due to the fact that they have exploited every possible food niche. On Wolf Island, the sharp-billed ground finches have discovered that if they peck at the base of the masked booby's flight feathers, they draw blood, which provides both food and drink. So far, this habit has only spread to one nearby island. Wolf is one of the most isolated of the group. Possibly the habit arose when the finches were cleaning parasites from the booby's wings and drew blood accidentally. There are no woodpeckers in the Galapagos, but there are a great many rotten trees whose trunks contain insects. The woodpecker finch and the closely related mangrove finch have found a way of exploiting this rich food supply. The habit was first observed in the woodpecker finch. By no means all woodpecker finches have mastered this trick, so it seems the ability is probably learned rather than inherited. A woodpecker finch who has mastered the technique starts by breaking off a probe. Woodpecker finches live in both the arid and moist zones. In dry areas, the chosen tool is often a cactus spine. Here, it's a green twig. The bird usually begins by listening, just as a woodpecker does, to find out if there's an insect at home. The beak is surprisingly powerful, so the bird has no problem breaking off twigs. Sometimes the finch will modify a twig to its liking by snapping off a side shoot and they are adept at holding a twig down with one foot while they size up the situation.
where a real woodpecker would use its sticky tongue to extract the grub from the tree, the finch manoeuvres it with the stick until it is within range of its beak. Incidentally, Darwin never witnessed this most exciting piece of finch behaviour. This time, it drops the stick. Occasionally, it retains it for future use. These two finches have detected a lively grub inside this dead tree. The dominant bird takes possession and listens at all the available holes. There's a fat beetle larva inside one of them. The grub is quite visible to the finch, but its beak is too short to reach it. So the next step is to select a twig. Not long enough, so back to look for a more suitable tool. A cutaway section of the tree shows the finch in action with a slightly longer twig. But this won't do the job either. The grub is too fat and the entrance to the hole too narrow. Perhaps purely by chance, or maybe profiting from past experience, the finch selects a third twig that is slightly curved and therefore more able to get a grip on the prey. Perseverance finally pays off. Finches find their food in many ways, this small ground finch is foraging for ticks on the leathery skins of the marine iguanas. In this one scene is encapsulated some of the wonders of the islands of the Galapagos. Here are two creatures, a bird and a reptile, that have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to become new species. In doing so, they have successfully adapted to one of the harshest environments on the face of the earth.
In the next program, Cold on the Equator, survival explores the equally strange marine life of the Galapagos, above and below the surface of the Pacific Ocean.